Hello everybody, it's Pastor Mark back for online worship here at East Brady Baptist Church. I am so glad that you joined us for online worship. I want to ask if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, if you, you see those, that comment section there, won't you leave us a comment so that we can know that you are with us. Let us know how you're doing. If you've got a prayer request, leave it there or something you're praising God for, leave it there and we'll be sure to pray with you and for you as the week goes on. Let's begin with our worship service, with our call to worship, which this week is adapted from Psalm 68. Praise be to the Lord our God. Praise to our Savior who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. Sing praises to God and proclaim His power. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you know all the sins that drive us to confess to you the ones of which we are shamed, but we are not afraid to commit. And because our senses are weak in comprehending your mysteries, grant, Lord, the things we do not ask because of the hardness of our hearts, and grant us pardon. With these words, we will to you our hearts and our minds. Spare us, O Lord, and forgive the sins we confess. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving our sins and scattering them far beyond reach. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, uh, just a couple of announcements today. Uh, number one, our congregational Thanksgiving dinner is coming up. That's Wednesday, November 17th at 6 p.m. We're going to have an Italian dinner here. We don't do the traditional Thanksgiving dinner because most people have that on Thanksgiving. So we do something a little different. So it'll be an Italian dinner, and we just want to invite you to come out to that. If you are interested in coming, won't you let us know that you will be here, and we'll be sure to have a place ready for you. That's November 17th at 6 p.m. Other announcement is, as you can see behind me, we are all set up for our Operation Christmas Child uh, shoebox campaign. Uh, that runs through Sunday, November 14th. We are collecting gift-filled shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, so you can just bring them here, drop them off here, and we'll make sure they get from here to the next place they need to go. If you don't know what Operation Christmas Child is, you can go to www.samaritanspurse.com. Dot org to see what that, that, that ministry is and to see how it changes things through giving gifts to children all over the world and how wonderful it is. And I hope you will be inspired uh, to participate with us if you're a regular part of our congregation that you continue uh, this year as in years past to, to bring in your gift-filled shoe boxes. But if you're someone who has never done it before, maybe you'll be inspired uh, to go and, and start this year. Uh, but that campaign, our last day for collecting those boxes is November 14th. So get your boxes into us. Uh, that said, let us go into our time uh, of teaching. And this week, our, our scripture lesson is taken from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. So if you've got a Bible or you got an electronic device you use to read your Bible, won't you open it up to Acts chapter 6? In a moment, I'm going to start reading to you from verse 1. And as usual, we're going to put the words up on the screen for you to follow along with as well. At Acts chapter 6, verse 1, it says, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. Just want to point out here before I get into my teaching, I, I got through all those strange names without really, really botching any of them. So it's a good day for me here. But today I risk uh, starting a conflict. I risk starting a conflict by talking about 
conflict. See, we don't like conflict. We don't like it because uh, this is often what we think of when a conflict. This is how we see conflict, right? Just anger and rage and shouting and hurt. So we don't like conflict. And because we don't like conflict, we don't like talking about conflict. So much so that we can get into conflict just by talking about conflict. Have I said the word conflict enough for you? You know that that's what we're talking about today. For instance, right now, Maybe there's some of you out there who are just, you're trying not to get annoyed. You're thinking, oh man, I hate it when they talk about conflict. I hate it when, when they talk about conflict in church. Why does he have to talk about this? But even though we don't like to talk about conflict, we really do need to address it here for, for several reasons. First, as I was preparing my sermon about church membership, maybe you caught it a couple weeks ago, I saw again that we have as part of our bylaws a protocol for conflict resolution. And in it, we lay out our expectations on how conflict should be handled within our fellowship according to some biblical principles. So it occurs to me that we should be familiar with those biblical principles. If we want to live by them, we need to know them, right? So, so that's one of the reasons we have to do this today. Second, within the New Testament, we see that conflict resolution really was and is a big deal because it's all about unity within the church of Jesus Christ. It's all about honoring Jesus Christ. And how can we do that if we are not united in him? You see, people having differing opinions and outlooks, that's not something new to our era. That's not something new in the church. You see, in the first century church, God was taking people from all these just vastly different cultural backgrounds, and they were coming to faith in Jesus Christ, and so they were all being put in one fellowship of believers. Uh, there, there were the ever-pious, seemingly prudish Jews, and there were the godless heathens, and there were the pagan Gentiles. And now they're all coming to faith in Jesus. They're coming together in one fellowship to follow and honor Jesus. You can see that was just conflict waiting to happen. All those people from different backgrounds coming together. So Jesus and the apostles were not silent on the topic as we see reflected in the New Testament scriptures. They weren't silent on how to address and how to resolve conflict. See, there are many, many verses and passages within the scriptures that instruct us about conflict and, and, and how to address it. I mean, in fact, look, here is a chart of just some uh, of those passages. And that's a lot of little words on one little page, isn't it? There's a lot there. So the scriptures aren't silent on it. So we really need to pay attention to what they're saying. The third reason we need to address conflict resolution is that we are really good at ignoring it. You see, when it comes to conflict, this is sadly one place where it seems that people of God so often come together and we just silently agree that eh, it's okay to ignore God's word on this subject. I mean, it's okay to pretend we don't know all those different scriptures in the New Testament that teach us how to approach conflict. Because, oh, oh, conflict makes you feel uncomfortable. Well, then it's okay. You don't need to really address it the way God tells you to. Oh, like, oh, yeah, I get it. You don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to stir things up more. So sure, it's fine to just ignore what God says about that here. Folks, when, when we're ignoring what God says, when we don't listen to what God says, and instead we go and we do things our own way, there's a word for that. It's called sin. And that's not okay. So we need to talk about conflict together as a way of encouraging us all to handle conflict in a way that God prescribes and in the way God desires for us as his children to do it. So in that sense, we at this congregation, we have a protocol for conflict resolution. And that resolution actually references two New Testament passages, although there are a lot more that could be included, as you saw in that graphic I put up there a few moments ago. Our, our, our protocol on conflict resolution references Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 18, which we are going to look at some other time. But it also references the passage out of Acts chapter 6. That is our lead scripture for today. It's what we're going to be looking at today. And in that simple story out of Acts chapter 6, we see it is just so important. It's so important to, to describe to us how, how to address conflict within our churches, our group conflict or, or congregation-wide conflict. Because if that conflict within that congregation hadn't been handled well, 
Well, there, there could have been drastic consequences. The situation would have eventually just blown up in disastrous ways. And some of you, you've seen how that happens when, when you're in a church or, or a group of people and you don't address conflict and it eventually just blows up, right? But if it had happened in that church, the early church 2,000 years ago, I mean, it would have taken out the early church and everything that grew from it, including us here today all these years later. See, that's why it's important that we don't just ignore conflict and we just don't wish it would go away, but that we address it head on in the manner which God desires for us to do it. And that's why we look at this today. We look at Acts chapter 6. That passage of scripture puts us in the early days of the church in Jerusalem. At that, that point, that's really the only place the church was. It was in Jerusalem. The church really hadn't grown yet out of any other city. Although by the end of the chapter, that's going to start to change. So there are, the church, there's one congregation, and it's in Jerusalem. And we read that as they are there, the Hellenistic Jews among them can play against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. That's what it says. Now, I just read this. I was like, it should not surprise us that the first conflict within a church was all about food. Because if we're going to fight or argue about anything, it's going to be about what we're eating, right? You know, we've all heard of those congregations that, that get into conflict over which soup they're going to serve at some luncheon sometime. So it's always all about the food. But really, what's going on here? Is it really about food? Well, to some degree, yes, there was a genuine concern about food here. We read that in the early days of the church, the believers, they would come and they would bring uh, to the church, to the leadership, they would bring gifts, they would bring money and property, or they would sell the property and bring the proceeds to the church so, so that the believers had the resources they needed to care for one another. One group of people who needed to be cared for were the widows among them. God, uh, throughout all the scriptures, the Old Testament tells us to make sure we're taking care of our widows. But this was important because this was before Social Security, this was before 401ks, this was before government assistance programs. These women, when their husbands died, uh, if their kids didn't have the resources to take care of them or just chose not to take care of them, and some of us know what that's like out there, right? These women were completely dependent on the church to provide for them the food they needed to survive. And apparently, some of the widows were, were getting what they needed while others were not. Or at least that was the perception. So, hey, there might be a real problem here. We, we, we've got hungry people. We've got hungry widows. But there's so much more going on here beyond food. I mean, in the early church in Jerusalem, you had two different uh, kinds of Jewish people. You had the more devout Jews, uh, the people who, who were really uh, into really just sticking to the law and, and making that their whole life. Uh, they were referred to in this passage as Hebraic Jews. And then you had the Hellenistic Jews, and, and, and they were a, a little less stern in their religious practices. That They were more worldly, perhaps is the way you would say it, perhaps coming from the secularized areas of Israel like Galilee. Culturally, ethnically speaking, these people are very different. You've got two different group, types of people here. And so it seems the Hellenistic Jews come forward with the actual accusation, look, you Hebraic Jews who control everything, you're holding back the food from our Hellenistic widows. They need to survive. Well, your widows are given more than enough. That was the accusation. Was it true? I don't know. We're not told that it was true or false. But whether it was true or not, the problem was at least perceived there was a problem there. And so now we've got a problem that's bigger than food, right? Because within this body of believers, we now have factions. In this case, divided among ethnic lines. Either the Hebraic Jews on one side were prejudiced against the Hellenistic Jews, or the Hellenistic Jews were just stirring up trouble because they didn't like those Hebraic Jews, or maybe both, right? Maybe both. So whether the accusation is true or not, we have a dis disruption in the unity of believers. A disruption that has the potential to just destroy everything, to tear them all apart. The question comes then, as a group, as a body of believers committed to Christ, how do you handle that? You see, this is the first time they had encountered this in the church. Well, that's what we see in the rest of the account. What happens? The first thing the scripture tells us is the 12 gathered all the disciples together. That's what it says. The 12 gathered all the disciples together. 
Now, just that short bit, that one sentence, we actually get several things. First, as we have already seen, the people who noticed the problem didn't keep it to themselves, but it seems they took it to the 12. They took it to the leaders. They had a problem and they took it to someone who could do something about it. They didn't sit around grumbling about it behind closed doors, riling people up and spreading dissatisfaction. You know, grumbling. That never gets you anywhere good. We've all been part of grumbling, right? Whether we're the grumblers or we're listening to somebody else grumble, it doesn't get you anywhere good. Nothing good ever comes of it. If you're part of a body of believers, whether it's here in this congregation, this context, or you just have a Bible study group or a group of believers, right? If someone comes at you and starts grumbling about what's going on in that fellowship, you need to get out. Get out of that conversation. Do it immediately. You're not doing the other person any good just by giving them a soundboard, an outlet for their inappropriate behavior, their inappropriate grumbling. And you're not doing yourself any good. It's only going to bring you down in a situation where you otherwise would be content. Now they got, they're bringing you down and maybe they're riling you up, right? See, when, when people grumble to you about others in a situation where there is a potential for conflict, what they are doing is called triangulating. Triangulating. Some of you, if you were a regular part of our congregation, you may remember a number of years ago, we had uh, Reverend Philip Moschenrose come in and do a conflict resolution workshop with us. And he taught us about triangles. You might remember going around doing this. It's supposed to be a triangle. It always looks more like a Hershey kiss to me, but it's supposed to be a triangle, right? Philip Moschenrose taught us about triangles within conflict. You see, conflict starts between two people. It's just them, one, two. Between them is a straight line, right? Nice and smooth straight line, a nice straight line of communication that they could use should they desire to conflict in order to resolve their conflict. So conflict starts with those two people. But, but what happens so often is that one or both of them, they start coming and grumbling to you, right? They grumble to you. So you no longer have just a straight line because it's them and one, two, and now it's you up here. Now you've got three. So now you are involved in a situation in a conflict that you may not desire to be part of, and you probably have no need to be part of that. And instead of that straight, easy, smooth line, you've now got a triangle. Triangles, they've got points. Where, whereas a smooth line, is, a straight line is just smooth. Triangles have sharp points. Points jab, they stab, they hurt. That's what triangulation does. Ultimately, it hurts people. And that's what grumbling is. It, is. it is causing those triangles. Grumbling hurts. Don't get caught up in it. So give these Hellenistic Jews some credit here. They didn't sit around grumbling. They didn't create those triangles, right? They took the situation to the leaders, to the apostles, who perhaps, hey, otherwise, they may have had no way of knowing that there was actually a problem out there, an issue that needed to be addressed. So, so they hear about this problem. The second lesson we learn here is that the apostles didn't ignore the problem. The leaders didn't say, well, this isn't something we really want to bother with, so we're just going to ignore it. And they didn't just push the Hellenists off saying, oh, that's not really a big problem, just get over it. No, the 12, they heard the problem and they took it seriously which is what caused them to do the third thing we learned here about addressing church-wide conflict. They brought the issue before everyone. They gathered all the disciples together, everyone who had a vested interest in this. They recognized that this wasn't just a personal issue with one or two people. If it's just one or two people, you could just go out there and you individually, you handle, you resolve that conflict yourself. But this was a church-wide problem. This was a systemic thing going on within their, their community. There was an issue within the fabric of their fellowship, how they all together lived out their life for Christ. So they needed everyone involved. So they called all the disciples, all the people who followed Jesus. They called them together to discuss it. And so they make sure that everyone hears everybody else's concerns. It's not, well, we'll just listen to this group over here and do what they're saying just to appease them because they're the loudest. No, it's let's provide the opportunity to hear from everyone and everyone is going to listen. And then let's work together to come up with some options, come up with some possibilities for a solution here that actually address the problem. 
That is why, even though here at East Brady Baptist Church, we have a church council, all major decisions were still brought before the congregation. That's why our church council has a spending cap, because if it's going to be expensive, it's going to be big. And the bigger it is, the, the more likely it is that, that, that people might have different opinions and, and there could be conflict there. So anything that might cause a, a large rift or conflict is put before the congregation for discussion. And that's why my commitment to you as a pastor is that anytime uh, an issue or decision seems like it cannot find consensus within our council because it's just too big for us to decide alone or we, we just can't agree on it, we're just not going to take a majority vote and just go with it, we'll either table it, or we're gonna table it for later or, or maybe never come back to it, or if we think we really need to do something about this, we're going to call a congregational meeting and hear everyone's voice on the matter. And we'll work together to brainstorm possible solutions that address everyone's concerns about what's going on. But now let's take a look at what the apostles told the people once they had done all that. They did that. Now what did they say? The apostles say in Acts chapter 6 verse 2, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Translation. God has called us apostles to preach and teach and proclaim the word of God to make sure new people hear it and that those who are among us continue to grow according to the word of God. So they pretty much say, we're not going to neglect that very specific duty given to us by Jesus Christ himself. Remember, these are men who walked with Jesus. We're not going to ignore that duty given to us by Jesus himself so we can spend our time doing something lots of other people can do, like waiting tables, like, like divvying up food evenly. See, on the surface, I read it, and it's kind of always seems to me like the Apostles Marie Antoinette moment. Marie Antoinette, some of you know the story about her. She was a queen uh, of France in the 17th, 18th century. Where she was told that the peasants were so poor they didn't have any bread. Well, Marie Antoinette, here she is, being stuck in her royal privilege. She responded, let them eat cake. See, not having bread, not a big deal for her. Just fill yourself with this cake instead. She's so far removed from the reality of being poor that she doesn't even understand how ridiculous it is to tell people too poor to afford bread that they can just go instead and eat a luxury like cake. Oh, and cake is a luxury, isn't it? Mmm, delicious cake. See, she doesn't understand, and she doesn't want to understand. Just, you know, go eat your cake or whatever. Don't bother me with this. As we encounter conflict within our life together at East Brady Baptist Church, let's make sure we ourselves are not having Marie Antoinette moments. Let's not be so caught up in our own selves and our own satisfaction, hey, I like how things are going here, that we cannot see why others might be upset. Let's not dismiss people with different perspectives simply because, well, we're just pleased with what we got going on here right now. Because that's not what we see the apostles doing. I know under your surface, that's kind of what it seems like. It seems like the apostles are, are trying to do that here. It's like they're saying, we're too busy being super spiritual and meditating on the word of God to care about this. But no, that's not actually what they're saying. That's not actually what's going on by their actions up to this point. They have proved that they are very aware that as God's chosen leaders, they have a responsibility for being concerned about this and, and for overseeing what is happening here. That's why they've been active up to now. They called the people together, right? So, of course, they are going to keep an eye on this. But their contention is that the nuts and bolts of doing what needs to be done to address this is an opportunity for others to serve. So the apostles say to the group in verses 3 and 4, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over them and we'll give our attention to the prayer and ministry of the Word. Folks, this is the, the forming of the first church committee. So, you know, blame them way back 2,000 years ago, right? They said form a committee. Choose some people to take care of this who are going to be responsible for this. But they say, make sure they are full of the spirit and wisdom. Translation, make sure these are godly people. Make sure these are people who are in it for the kingdom of God and they're not in it just for themselves. And the apostles say, hey, we're going to go back to ministering according to the word. Like everything else in the church, they will continue to oversee what is going on, even with this situation, to make sure it proceeds according to the word of God. 
but the day-to-day -day operations of figuring out how to make sure all the widows are cared for, that's going to go to this group of people. You see, when faced with conflict, the entire body gets together to come up with a plan to address all concerns. And maybe not everyone gets exactly what they want right away. I mean, I'm sure there are probably some Hebraic Jews there who could have continued grumbling after this. I don't know why we got to do all this. Things were just fine for us before. Or maybe there were some Hellenish Jews left over who could have, if they wanted, they could have continued grumbling. I don't know why they just don't give everything to us now so we can give to our widows since their widows got it all before. That didn't seem to happen because the goal is to come together in unity and find a solution that addresses the source of the conflict. The goal is not to just push something through and get your own way. Unfortunately, in many of our congregations, unity in Christ takes a backseat to personal agendas. That's kind of how things happened at the church I grew up in. But that wasn't the case at the church in Acts chapter 6. And that's why they were successful in resolving conflict. See, this plan they came up with apparently did address the source of the conflict because verse 5 tells us, quote, the proposal pleased the whole group. I mean, as a pastor, that just astounds me. I can't imagine ever come up with a proposal that pleases everyone, right? But it pleases the whole group. So they appoint uh, these seven men to oversee the process of caring for these widows. Seven men with Greek names, by the way, which probably indicates they were all Hellenist Jews. See, together, they wanted to make sure that all the widows were cared for, especially the Hellenist ones who may have been left out before. Their desire to live as the church of Jesus Christ trumped personal preferences and ethnic prejudices. So the, the Hebrew Jews weren't there saying, I'm afraid I won't get my own if they're all Hellenists. No, they were saying, let's just do this. Let's get God's work done. They wanted to work for Jesus. They wanted to serve Jesus. See, it always comes back to our love of Jesus and our desire to serve Jesus. Anytime we are in conflict, it's because someone or maybe everyone has taken their eyes off Jesus. We've taken our eyes off the fact that we are sinners and we are guilty, but God loved us so much he sent Jesus to die for us. We take our eyes off Jesus, and so we become selfish or self-serving, or at least some of us do, or we just kind of look to our own desires so much that we ignore our purpose within the church, which is to spur one another on toward uh, faith and to bring others to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that takes a back seat, and that's why we get into conflict. See, if Jesus is at the center, then nothing else is more important. Nothing is more important than coming together for his purpose. If we cannot come together in unity, it's because Jesus is not at the center of our desires. That's why the church in Acts chapter 6, they were successful in resolving conflict. A conflict that could have just derailed everything. What they cared about most was Jesus. And because they cared about Jesus, they cared about each other. What they desired most was the advancement of the kingdom of God. That's why instead of grumbling, those who saw an issue took it to the leaders because they loved Jesus and they loved each other. And that's why the leaders took it seriously because they loved Jesus and they love each other. And that's why the people worked together to come up with the plan because they love Jesus and they love each other. And that's why the people embraced the plan, even though for some it might have seemed imperfect because they love Jesus and they love each other. All because they loved Jesus. It is our desire here as a congregation at East Brady that we love Jesus. And because we love Jesus, we love each other. And that's why, based on this, our protocol for conflict resolution actually reads, here it is, the second part of it. Sometimes a conflict arises over the proper way to do ministry in the church this was the case in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, which tells the story of the inner conflicts of the church in Jerusalem. This passage teaches us another biblical mode. The first step was convening the church and identifying the issue. The people generated options which addressed the interests of all parties, and they selected one solution that addressed the situation they were facing. The last step was that the ministries were resumed and the church membership grew. 
We established as our protocol the biblical models for reconciliation of Christian relationships as described in these and other scriptures. See, that's our commitment. We have this commitment to coming together and obeying God, listening to God, and resolving conflict within our fellowship according to these biblical principles. We do it because we love Christ. And because we love Christ, we love each other. We love each other too much not to do it. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much uh, for giving us Jesus Christ to bring us peace with you. Like through Christ, you reconciled us to you. And you call us to do likewise in our relationships when, with one another. When, when something comes up that separates us or we have conflict, you call us to reconcile. You call us to be at peace. You call us to be peacemakers. Father, forgive us for those times when we have refused to listen to you in this, when, when we've been afraid to follow uh, what you say uh, about conflict and how to handle conflict, or we just haven't wanted to do it. Forgive us when we've just been so into ourselves that we haven't wanted to listen to others and we haven't wanted to be part of that solution uh, of coming together in unity for Jesus Christ because we love Jesus. We confess and we ask your forgiveness, God. And we ask you to give us the, the boldness. We give, you give us the wisdom to go forth now. That when conflict comes within our fellowship, and we know it will, God, but when it comes, give us the boldness and the wisdom uh, to, to face it down the way you desire. Uh, to look to your word uh, for examples of how, how we handle conflict and let us go after resolving that conflict, God, so that we might be one in your son, Jesus Christ, and we can be the church that you intend us to be. We pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of another online worship service. I always enjoy being here and I'm so glad you could join us. Hey, if you uh, are in the area and you're able to get out and about, won't you consider joining us for in-person worship every Sunday at 1030 a.m.? We'd love to see you. Uh, in a moment here, we are going to conclude uh, our worship service uh, with a hymn. But before then, won't you first receive the blessing? May the grace of Christ our Savior, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.